Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Our loving Father, we thank you so much for your word, which is a sure guide in a world of confusion and rebellion. We ask for the guidance of your Holy Spirit as we study that great prophecy of Revelation 12. We ask that you will teach us and give us understanding that we might be willing to follow your will. We thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to begin our study today by reviewing what we studied in our last lecture. If you remember, we studied the prophecy of Daniel chapter 2. You remember that King Nebuchadnezzar had this dream. And in the dream he saw a gigantic image. The head of the image was of gold. The breast and the arms were of silver. silver. The belly was of bronze. The legs were of iron. And the feet were of iron and clay. And then Nebuchadnezzar saw a gigantic stone come from heaven and smite the image on its feet and broke the image into smithereens and then that stone began, became a mountain which filled the whole earth. Now I'm going to review the sequence of nations which are mentioned in Daniel chapter 2. The head of gold represents the kingdom of Babylon which governed from the year 605 till the year 539 BC. The breast and arms of silver represent the kingdom of Medo-Persia which governed from 539 to 331 BC. The belly of bronze represents the kingdom of Greece which ruled from the year 331 till the year 168 BC. The fourth kingdom of iron represented by the legs represents the iron monarchy of Rome, in other words the Roman Empire. And of course the feet of iron and clay, ten toes, represent the divisions of Western Europe. But you'll notice that the divisions of Western Europe are a continuation of Rome because the feet have iron just like the legs have iron, but this is a different kind of Rome. It is a continuation of Rome because it's the same iron as the legs, but it is a different kind of Rome because it is a mixed Rome. And we studied in our last lecture that the clay represents the church. In other words, after the Roman Empire was split up, you had a period where church and state were joined together. And actually that condition lasts until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now the kingdom that we're especially going to focus on on our study today is the fourth kingdom of Daniel chapter 2. We're going to be quite a bit of time in the image, the portion that has to do with the legs of iron. Now we need to look at some background before we actually get into the study of Revelation chapter 12. Go with me once again to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, that verse which has guided us in the study uh, in this seminar. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Very well known verse. God is speaking to the serpent and he says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He, that is the seed of the woman, shall bruise your, that is the serpent's head, and you shall bruise his heel. Four key elements in this verse. Number one, enmity. Number two, a serpent. Number three, a woman. And number four, seed. Now we're going to find that this verse is in the background of Revelation chapter 12. I want you to notice that in Genesis 3.15 though there is warfare between the woman and the serpent the real warfare is between the seed of the woman and the serpent. Because the last part of the verse says he, the seed of the woman, will bruise your head that is the head of the serpent and the serpent will bruise his heel. The war is between the seed of the woman 
and the serpent even though there is also warfare between the serpent and the woman. Now we've also studied in our seminar that the devil tried to keep Jesus from coming all throughout the Old Testament. We had a whole lecture on all of the episodes of the Old Testament which illustrate how Satan tried to keep the seed from coming. He did it by trying to kill the seed. And then he also did it by trying to corrupt the holy line from which the seed would come. But folks, the devil was not able to interrupt the plans of God. In the fullness of time, Jesus came to this world exactly the way God had prophesied in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Now there's one more thing that I want to notice by means of introduction before we get into a specific study of Revelation 12. And that is that this chapter has three distinct stages. The first stage is found in Revelation 12 and verses 1 through 5. And that is the stage where the dragon tries to kill the seed of the woman. By the way, that's clearly a reference to Genesis 3.15. The dragon trying to kill the seed that is born of the woman. That's the first stage. The second stage is found in Revelation 12 and verse 6 and also verses 13 through 15. In this stage, the child has already escaped the grasp of the serpent or the grasp of the dragon. And so the dragon now goes after the woman and the woman flees to the wilderness where she has her place prepared for 1260 days or years. The third stage in this chapter is the final warfare of the dragon against the seed of the seed, the remnant of her seed as it says in Revelation 12 and verse 17. And so we find three distinct stages of warfare in Revelation chapter 12. First, the devil against the seed. Secondly, the devil or the serpent against the woman. Third, the warfare of Satan against the remnant of the woman's seed. And of course the woman's seed is Jesus. So the remnant of the woman's seed would be the remnant of Jesus. Three distinct stages. I want you to remember these stages because we're going to come back to them later on. What I want you to notice is that in all of these three stages it is the serpent or the dragon who is the, the uh, perpetrator of the events that are taking place. Now he uses human instruments but really he is the force behind. He's the one who tries to kill the child, he's the one who persecutes the woman, and he is the one who launches the final onslaught of warfare against the remnant of the woman's seed. Now we want to examine another Old Testament story which forms the backdrop specifically to the prophecy of Revelation chapter 12. I'm referring to the story of the exodus of Israel from Egypt. Now you say what possible relationship could there be between Revelation chapter 12 and the exodus of Israel from Egypt? Well I believe that as we move along in studying the exodus of Israel we're going to begin to see some interesting parallels to Revelation chapter 12. Now time does not allow us to read all of the verses which describe the exodus of Israel from Egypt. Uh, in the handout that you will receive after the lecture today you have all of the scripture references with explanations about all that I'm going to share. For now what I want is for you to catch the picture or the idea of what happened at the Exodus so that uh, when we go to Revelation chapter 12 you're able to see this backdrop. Now Exodus chapter 1, I'm going to mention the verses, Exodus chapter 1 verses 13 and 14 explains that Israel was in cruel and despotic bondage. They had no way of escaping themselves. They were slaves. They had to serve Pharaoh day after day after day. In fact there in Exodus 1, 13 and 14 it uses the word bitter to describe their bondage. 
And so in Exodus chapter 2 in verses 23 to 25 we find that the people are moaning and groaning and crying out because they want a deliverer to be born to lead them out from bondage because they know that they cannot deliver themselves because they are slaves. And it's interesting to notice in that passage in Exodus 2 23 to 25 that they're, they're crying out I want you to remember that word. They're crying out. They're groaning because they want someone to deliver them from bondage. Well, it just so happens that a deliverer was born in Egypt. He was born of a woman. I want you to remember that. The name of the woman was Jacobed, his mother. And so we find here a child, a man child, who is going to be born of a woman and he is going to be the deliverer of Israel from bondage when they are crying out to God for deliverance. But there was one who did not want this child to survive. He felt threatened by his existence or by his potential existence. And of course the name of that individual was Pharaoh. Now do you know that in the book of Ezekiel chapter 29 and verse 3 Pharaoh, and by the way this is in the King James Version Pharaoh is called the great dragon. I want you to remember that. Pharaoh is called the great dragon. The New King James says the great monster. You know if you read the Greek translation of the Old Testament you'll find that the word there is the word drakon. And so we're dealing not with a monster as such, we are dealing with a dragon. So Pharaoh is called the great dragon. And the Bible says that Pharaoh stands next to the woman, so to speak, to devour this child, this deliverer, as soon as he is born. Have you read this story? Are you starting to catch an interesting picture here? This is really the backdrop of Revelation chapter 12. Now it's interesting to notice how Pharaoh tried to get rid of the deliverer. In Exodus chapter 1 and verse 22 it says that Pharaoh had all of the male children thrown into the Nile River. In other words he had all of the male children killed in the hopes of also killing the deliverer. Now I must make a parenthesis here and explain to you that the devil had a greater agenda here than just slaying Moses. Did you know that approximately 400 years before this God had given a prophecy to Abraham. It's found in Genesis chapter 15 and verses 13 through 15 and in that prophecy God had told Abraham that the children of Israel were going to be sojourners in the land of Egypt for 400 years. But that after the 400 years God was going to deliver them from Egypt and he was going to take them to Canaan. Do you think the devil carefully calculated when the 400 years began and when the 400 years ended? Of course he did. The devil did not want Israel to be delivered from bondage because he knew that if Israel went to Canaan, in Canaan the Messiah would be born. And so he says, I'm going to nip this in the bud. I am going to kill the deliverer so that Israel cannot leave Egypt and cannot enter Canaan. And that way the deliverer will not be born. And folks, it is no coincidence that the Canaanites fought tooth and nail for the promised land. This was not only their attitude, it was Satan inspiring them to resist Israel entering the promised land because the devil knew that in that place the Messiah was going to be born and he knew it because God had taken Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees and he took him to Haran and then he took him to the promised land and so the devil says I cannot allow a deliverer to exist I must kill him, I must nip this in the bud, and that way Israel will remain in bondage. But it's interesting that Moses was preserved in Egypt. 
His life was spared. He was protected in the land of Egypt. And of course we are told in Exodus that he became the great deliverer of the children of Israel. In fact, the night that Israel was delivered, I want you to notice this is very interesting, the night that Israel was delivered, God told them as a sign of their deliverance to sacrifice a lamb without blemish. In other words, the sign of their deliverance was the death of a perfect lamb. And when they sacrificed that lamb, they were delivered from bondage to the literal Egyptians. Now, there's much more that we need to say. Before Israel entered the promised land, Moses the deliverer died on the borders of Canaan. The story of his death is found in Deuteronomy chapter 34 and I'm not going to go there I just want to mention the verses Deuteronomy 34 5 and 6 there are two strange things about the death of Moses. Number one we are told in Deuteronomy 34 that God buried Moses. That he's the only person in the Bible that God ever buried. We don't know of anyone else who God buried. Not even Jesus. <laughs> Jesus wasn't buried by his father. But Moses was buried by God. And another interesting detail, which is very strange, is the fact that it says there in Deuteronomy 34 that no one knew where his tomb was till that day. Very unusual because the Jews marked the tombs of their heroes. They knew exactly where Abraham was buried in the cave of Machpelah. They knew where uh, David was buried in Jerusalem and also probably where Daniel the prophet was buried because an inscription has been found that says here lies Daniel the prophet. Recently his, his body wasn't found but the inscription says that Daniel was buried there. The Jews marked the tombs of their heroes but with Moses God buried him and nobody knew where his tomb was. Do you know what happened when Moses died according to scripture? He died, he was buried, and when he was buried we're told in the book of Jude verse 9, I only mentioned the verse because Jude only has one chapter, Jude verse 9 that there was a battle at the grave site of Moses. It says there that Michael the archangel fought with Satan over the body of Moses. Now do you think that they were fighting for a dead corpse? Do you think that every time a person dies uh, Michael the archangel and the devil fight over a dead body? Obviously not. By the way that individual Michael the archangel was none less than Jesus Christ himself. Now let me explain that the Bible does not teach that Michael the Archangel was the first creature of God like some churches teach. We believe that Michael the Archangel is Christ but Christ is everlasting God. He never had a beginning. He is the great angel of the resurrection, the great messenger of the resurrection. That's the reason why in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 we're told that the Lord will descend with a shout. The Lord himself will descend with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. Notice that the Lord himself utters the voice of the archangel. And so there was this battle over the body of Moses. And actually Michael had come to resurrect Moses. You say, now how do you know that? Well, it's very, very simple. In Matthew chapter 17 and verse 3, we find the episode where Jesus was transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration. And we are told there that as Jesus was being transfigured, in other words he was glorified there, and it says that his garments shone like the sun, we're told that two individuals were sent to speak with him. One of them of course was Elijah who was translated to heaven from among the living. The other was Moses. Now what was Moses doing there 1400 years after his death? It must be that he resurrected. Because if he didn't resurrect, he could not have come to speak to Jesus. In other words, Moses died once he had delivered Israel from Egypt. He died, he was buried, he resurrected, and he ascended to heaven. Now let's summarize 
what we've studied about Moses. Moses delivered literal Israel from literal bondage in literal Egypt, took them across a literal desert to a literal land of Canaan. They sacrificed a literal lamb. Moses brought literal water from a literal rock and literal bread from heaven. A literal serpent was raised up in the literal desert to prevent literal death from literal poison. In other words, what happened in the Old Testament was literal and local, but it symbolized future events which would be spiritual and global. In other words, we have in this episode of Moses a prophecy of a far greater event which was going to take place in the future and which was foreshadowed by this experience of Israel leaving the land of Egypt. Are you clear in what we've spoken about so far? You have the backdrop of Daniel 2. Don't forget that. The fourth kingdom of Daniel 2. That's the key right now. Rome. The empire of Rome. The iron monarchy of Rome. That's the backdrop of which kingdom from the Old Testament? The fourth kingdom of Daniel 2. We have the backdrop of Genesis 3.15. Let me ask you, do you have the same elements in the story of Moses that you have in Genesis 3.15? Do you have enmity? Yes, you do. Do you have a woman? Yes, Jacobet. Do you have a seed? Yes, Moses. Do you have the dragon wanting to kill the seed? Absolutely. And so really this story of the exodus from Egypt is really a reenactment of the story that is told in Genesis 3 and verse 15. Now let's go in our Bibles to Revelation chapter 12 and verses 1 through 5. Revelation chapter 12 verses 1 through 5. And I'm going to read this uh, passage. I'm actually going to read all five verses and then we're going to study them more carefully. It says here, Now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman, clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Now notice, there's a woman. Verse 2. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. So do you have a seed in her womb? Yes. Okay, verse 3. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems on his heads. Verse 4. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven, speaks about his origin, and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it, ha it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Question. Do you have a woman in this passage? Yes you do. Do you have a dragon or a serpent in this passage? Yes we do. Do you have enmity in this passage? Absolutely. And do you have in this passage a seed which the woman is going to bring into the world? Yes. This is really a development and an unfolding of the prophecy of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. And by the way, it is also a greater amplification on a worldwide scale of the experience that took place with Moses when he delivered Israel from the land of Egypt. By the way, do you know that the New Testament presents Jesus as a new Moses? Or as one greater than Moses? Notice the book of Hebrews chapter 3 and verses 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 3 and verses 1 and 2. Here there's a comparison between Moses and Jesus. It says there in verse 1, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus Christ, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. In other words, 
Moses was great. But Jesus is greater than Moses. In fact, do you know that Moses in Deuteronomy 18 verses 15 through 18 predicted that a prophet greater than himself would arise. And that Israel was to listen to that prophet greater than himself. If you read Acts chapter 3 and verses 22 to 26, you'll discover that clearly in Acts 3, 22 to 26, Peter identifies Jesus as that prophet greater than Moses. In other words, Jesus is going to do what Moses did, but on a much larger and greater scale. Whereas Moses delivered literal Israel from literal bondage, Jesus was going to deliver the human race from spiritual bondage to sin. Now let's draw the parallel. Go with me once again to Revelation chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2. Revelation chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2. We just read those verses, but let's read them again. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. You have a woman here in Revelation chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. Now, in the Old Testament you have a literal woman who brings Moses into the world. But in Revelation chapter 12, the woman is symbolic. What does the woman represent? The woman represents the church. The question is, which church? The Old Testament church or the New Testament church? It has to be the Old Testament church. And you say, how do we know that? Very simple. When John sees the woman, she is with child, but the child has not been born. She's crying out in pain because she wants this child to be delivered. She wants this child to deliver God's people. Just like Israel in the Old Testament was crying out for deliverance. Now do you know that in the Old Testament Israel is presented as the wife of God? Notice what we find in Jeremiah 31 and verse 32. Jeremiah 31 and verse 32. This is speaking about the episode that took place at Mount Sinai. And it says there, actually let's read verse 31 for the context. Behold the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of, Je of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Now notice this. My covenant which they broke, though I was a what? Though I was a husband to them. So who is the husband of this woman? The husband of this woman is God. Who implanted Jesus in the womb of Mary? God the Father did. Are you with me or are you not with me? In other words, the woman here represents the Old Testament church culminating with Mary who was a member of that church, so to speak. By the way, in Jeremiah 6 and verse 2, Israel is to compare to a beautiful and delicate woman. In other words, when you find in prophecy a woman, it represents the church. And in the case of Revelation chapter 12, this woman must represent God's church in the Old Testament. Because when John sees the woman, the child has not yet been born. In other words, what John is seeing is the Old Testament church moaning and groaning and crying out in labor pains because they want the Messiah to be born into the world to deliver the human race from sin. Now you say, how do you know that it's the Old Testament church? Well, besides the fact that this, uh, that this woman has not had the child yet, we have another clue that indicates that this represents the Old Testament church. Go with me to Genesis chapter 37 and verses 9 and 10. Genesis 37 and verses 9 and 10. It's speaking here about the sons of uh, Jacob. And uh, it's very interesting to notice a dream that Joseph had. Notice verse 9. Then he dreamed still another dream, and told it to his brothers, and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream. 
and this time the sun, moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. What are the brothers of, J of Joseph compared to? They are compared to stars. Who would the twelfth star be? It would be Joseph. The sun would be Jacob, and the moon would be his wife, the eleven stars would be the brothers of Joseph, and the twelfth star would be Joseph. So what do the twelve stars represent? They represent the sons of Jacob, which later became what? They became the tribes of Israel, which is God's Old Testament church. Are you following what I'm saying? In fact, in Genesis 49 verse 28, it says that the twelve sons of Jacob became the twelve tribes of Israel. Now let me ask you, were God's people in bondage when Jesus was about to come to this world? Yes they were, in bondage to what? Are we talking literal bondage? I mean were they real, literally slaves of a slave master? Absolutely not. They were slaves to what? Slaves to sin. Notice John chapter 8. John chapter 8 and we'll read verse 34 to 36. John 8, 34 to 36. Jesus is speaking to the Jews who were expecting the Messiah. And notice what he says in verse 34. Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a what? A slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So were God's people in slavery or in bondage when Jesus came? Absolutely. Were they crying out for a deliverer? Yes, they were waiting for the consolation of Israel, it says in Luke chapter 1. And then of course, Jesus is born. And what was he born for? Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21 has the answer. You will call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their what? He shall save his people from their sins. Was Jesus the Savior born into this world to deliver his people from spiritual bondage to sin? Were his people groaning and moaning, waiting for the consolation of Israel? Absolutely. And by the way, Jesus is born during the time of the legs of iron. Don't forget that. He's born during the period of the fourth kingdom of Daniel chapter 2. Now let me ask you, when Jesus was born, was somebody waiting for him? Did somebody know that he was going to be born? Absolutely. Notice Revelation chapter 12 and verses 3 and 4. Are you seeing the repetition of the Moses story? Revelation chapter 12 and verses 3 and 4. It says here, speaking about this uh, dragon, and another sign appeared in heaven. Behold a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven, this speaks about his origin, where he came from, and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth, to devour her child as soon as he was born. What is the name of this individual who wanted to devour the child? The what? The great dragon. Do you remember an Old Testament individual who was called the great dragon? Pharaoh. Now who really wanted the death of Jesus? It was Satan, the great dragon. Now who was that great dragon? Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9 has the answer. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9 tells us who this dragon was. It says, so the great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old, or that ancient serpent as it says in the King James, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So who is the dragon that stood next to the woman to devour the child as soon as the child was born? It was the great dragon, Satan, the ancient serpent, which is a reference to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Now how did the devil try and destroy Jesus? The devil wanted to destroy Moses, didn't he? 
Who did Moses, who did uh, the devil use to try and destroy Moses? Pharaoh. See, Pharaoh was the great dragon because he was the instrument of the great dragon. Let me ask you, when Jesus was born, was there also the great dragon who uses a great dragon to try and destroy Christ? Yes. What was the name of that individual? He was called Herod. Do you see that the devil has his seed? Are you following me with Revelation, uh, with Genesis 3 verse 15? The devil works through his what? Through his seed. To destroy the woman's seed. Now notice Matthew chapter 2 and verses 13 through 15. Matthew chapter 2 and verses 13 through 15. Here we find the story of how the devil tried to destroy Jesus. He did not do it directly himself, he did it through an instrument, just like in the days of Moses. It says in verse 13, Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt. Where was the life of Jesus preserved? In, of course, that's all a coincidence. In Egypt! Where was the life of Moses preserved? In Egypt! And so it says, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. Now notice verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he went forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts from two years old and under according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Is he doing the same thing that Pharaoh did in the Old Testament? Yes, in the Old Testament it was a figure, but in this case it is the fulfillment of what we find in the story of Moses. Incidentally, do you know the devil tried to kill Jesus on other occasions during his life? He didn't only try to kill Jesus when Jesus was born. Do you remember for example one time Jesus was preaching a sermon in Nazareth and he said some very politically incorrect things? The people shoved him out of the synagogue and they took him to a precipice and they wanted to throw him over the precipice. He disappeared from their midst. He was actually, he was actually covered by the angels so that the people could not see him. Who do you suppose was behind that? The devil. You say, well, but if Jesus died, he would save us from our sins. Listen, the only death that would count would be if Jesus offered his life, not if the devil took his life. And the devil knew it. So he says, if I'm able to kill him before he gives his life, I will be successful. Once the devil tried to drown Jesus in a storm, he was sleeping in a boat. See, we don't usually read these stories from this perspective. We usually say, oh, there, there was this bad storm, you know, and Jesus calmed the storm. Listen, the devil knew that Jesus was sleeping in that boat, and the devil wanted to drown Jesus, because it was not a time of storms. Because all of the fishing boats were on the lake. In Galilee, fishermen do not go out onto the lake when it's stormy season. They simply don't. And so this was a storm out of season. On other occasions, the devil had to, tried to have Jesus stoned. On several occasions, people picked up stones to stone Jesus. The devil was behind this. But all through the life of Jesus, God the Father spared the life of Jesus. The devil also tried to defeat Jesus by infiltrating him with sin. Are you seeing the same two methods that the devil used in the Old Testament? Try and kill the seed and try to corrupt the seed? He did the same thing with Jesus. He tried to kill him repeatedly. And he tried to infect Jesus with the virus of sin. But every time that the devil tried to infect Jesus with the virus of sin, Jesus said, it is written. And he resisted the temptations of Satan. The devil also tried to get Jesus to retaliate. You see, when Jesus is suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he's sweating drops of blood, when Jesus is being beaten in Pilate's court and in Herod's court, 
it, the devil is doing this because he wants Jesus to do one of two things. He wants Jesus to retaliate and thus to sin, to deliver himself. Or secondly, he wants Jesus to give up and to leave and go back to heaven without redeeming the human race. He does not want Jesus to go to the cross and die. He's causing these sufferings because he wants to bother Jesus so much that Jesus will retaliate or Jesus will leave when he sees that his disciples have forsaken him, that there's nobody with him. The devil's saying, what's the use of you going through this? Nobody's going to be saved. Everybody's forsaken you. Go back to heaven where you're loved. But Jesus stuck with it. And the Bible tells us that Jesus died as the Passover lamb. Is that what happened for the deliverance of Israel in the Old Testament? Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. See, Jesus is repeating the history of Israel. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. The Apostle Paul says this, Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. And do you know what Jesus did when he died on the cross? Notice John chapter 12. John chapter 12. And let's read verses uh, 31 to 33. John 12 verses 31 to 33. And I want you to notice the tense of the verbs. Jesus says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. What tense is that verb? Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Jesus had not died yet. What was going to cast him out? Notice, it continues saying there in verse 32, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. What was it that cast out Satan as the king of this world? What returned the kingdom and the world back to Jesus? It was the death of Jesus on the cross. Now we can remember Genesis 3.15. God said that he's going to send a seed to the world and the seed is going to crush the serpent's head. And just a few verses further down in verse 21, God explains how that seed is going to crush the serpent's head. It says in Genesis 3 verse 21 that lambs were sacrificed on that day. And from the skins of the sacrifice, the nakedness of Adam and Eve was covered. In other words, they returned to their original condition. And so Genesis 3.15 says, the seed will crush your head. Verse 21 of chapter 3 explains that it's the death of the lamb that will crush the serpent's head. In John chapter 12, Jesus says, the ruler of this world will be cast out. And then he explains how. It's because he is going to what? Because he is going to die. And when Jesus on the cross said, it is finished, he had won back the kingdom of this world. And he had won back the earth to return to man who lost it originally. Now I want you to notice Revelation chapter 12 and verse 5. By the way, we all know that Jesus died, right? Was he buried? Was he buried? Yes, he was buried. Uh, hey, what happened the third day? He what? He rose from the dead. Did that happen to Moses? Yeah, and what happened to Moses after he rose from the dead? He ascended to where? To heaven. Now how about this male child? After he won the victory on the cross, He's buried. He dies. He's buried. And on the third day he what? He resurrects. And where does he go? Revelation chapter 12 and verse 5. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 5. It says here, She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Now do you know how heaven felt when Jesus got back to heaven? Let's notice Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 and I would like to begin reading at verse 10. Revelation chapter 12 
and verse 10. And I want you to notice the tense of the verbs here. You see in John 12, Jesus has not died yet. He's pronouncing these words about Wednesday before his crucifixion. And so he says, now is the judgment of this world. Now the prince of this world will be cast out. And then he says, he will be cast out by his death. But notice the tense of the verbs in Revelation chapter 12. Jesus is now in heaven. He's been caught up to God into his throne. Notice what it says in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. Why is that? For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. What tense is the verb? Past. Because he's already died on the cross. He's already died as the Passover lamb. He's already delivered his people from bondage to the great dragon. And his people are on the way to Canaan. Eventually someday to enter there. Notice verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. And now notice verse 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Let's stop there. What are the heavens supposed to do because Jesus has cast down the ruler of this world and now Jesus legally rules? The heavens are supposed to what? Rejoice. Why should they rejoice? Because that pest can't go up there anymore. The accuser of the brethren has been cast out. Jesus is now the representative of this world. Jesus as the second Adam has legally recovered the world. He hasn't empirically taken it yet, but legally in court he has gained the world back. And so it says here, Rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But now notice, Woe! Do you catch that? Rejoice! Woe! Rejoice! Woe! Up there, rejoice. Down here, woe. Why woe on earth? Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. That's us. For the devil has come down to you because he's been cast down having great what? Great wrath because he knows that he has but what? He has but a short time. Now we need to quickly look at the final stages of Revelation chapter 12. We've only discussed the first stage up till now, and that's the one that I primarily wanted us to understand. But there's two additional stages. Let's go to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 6. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 6. What happens after this child ascends to heaven? The, dra the dragon is furious, he's enraged. He can't vent his rage upon the child anymore because the child beat him and is back in heaven. So what does the devil have to do? He has to take second best. And what is second best? To go after the woman. Notice verse 6. Then the woman, that is then, after the child ascends to heaven, then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1260 days. Where does the woman go? She flees into the what? Into the wilderness where God has prepared a place for her and feeds her 1260 days which are really what? Years. Now the question is why is she fleeing? Who's persecuting her? Well, later on in the chapter we have an explanation of this verse. Notice verse 13. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, does the persecution of the woman have anything to do with the fact that the devil has been cast out as a rule of this world? He's filled with rage because he doesn't have access to Jesus anymore. So it says, now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. See, now the enmity is between the serpent and the woman. Revelation 3, 5, I mean Genesis 3.15 has that also. The serpent and the woman are at war. And the seed of the woman and the serpent are at war. He already warred against the seed of the woman and lost. So now he goes after the woman. 
And notice verse 14, But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished. Same elements as verse 6, right? Where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth, that's his peoples, his multitudes, like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. And so after the child escapes, is there a period where the dragon goes after the woman? Yes. How long does he go after the woman? 1260 years. Would you think that this would be the period of the feet of the mixture of church and state? All you have to do is look at history in the Middle Ages. You see that it was the, the nominal church of the Middle Ages that persecuted God's people who were in the wilderness, so to speak. The Waldenses and the Albigenses and others had to flee from the established church that wanted to destroy them because the church said that they were heretics. And so here you have the feet of iron and clay, the mixture of church and state. Now in Daniel 2 you don't have any specific time period given to the feet, but in our lecture on Daniel 7 we are going to study how after this dragon rules for a period he's going to sprout ten horns and then among the ten horns will rise a little horn and the little horn will rule time, times, and the dividing of time. Revelation 12 is covering the same period as Daniel 2 and the same period as we will study from Daniel chapter 7. Now I want you to notice, we're not going to get into this in detail, but when the woman is being persecuted, she flees into the wilderness, God maintains her there, God feeds her there, but then suddenly something comes to the rescue. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 16 says, But the earth helped the woman. And the earth opened up its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Does persecution come to an end? Yes or no? Absolutely. When would it come to an end? It would have to be when the 1260 years end. Because the church, the woman is persecuted for 1260 years. So the earth helping the woman must come after this period. The earth swallows up the waters of persecution, persecution ceases for a period. Does it cease forever? No. Notice the third stage of Revelation 12 and verse 17. This will be our final closing verse. And the dragon was enraged with the woman. Why? Because the earth helped the woman, right? Was enraged with the woman. We'll talk about the earth later on in this seminar. And he went to make what? War. And it says here in the New King James with the rest of her offspring. I like the King James Version. It says, with the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Do you have the same four elements in Revelation 12, 17 as you have in Genesis 3, 15? Let's look at it. Do we have in Revelation 12, 17 enmity? Yes or no? Absolutely. Do we have in Revelation 12 verse 17 a woman? Yes we do. Do we have in Revelation 12 17 a dragon or a serpent? Yes. Do we have in Revelation 12 17 a seed? Yes we do. And by the way Revelation 12 17 is not speaking about the seed of the woman, it's talking about the seed's seed. I'll let you digest that for a couple of seconds. The warfare is not against the seed, it's not even against the woman, it's against the seed's seed, the final remnant of the woman's seed. Now who is the woman's seed? We already studied it. Verses 1 through 5 says that the seed of the woman that she bears is what? Jesus. So who must the remnant of her seed be? If her seed is Jesus, it must be the remnant of Jesus. You're not following me, are you? It's the remnant of Jesus. 
So are there going to be Christians in this world in the final persecution of Satan against the church? Absolutely. By the way, in John chapter 2 and 12 and verse 24, Jesus says that unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, it cannot bear fruit. But if it falls into the ground and dies, it will grow into a plant and produce much fruit. That seed was Jesus. When Jesus died on the cross, he was planted in the earth. He resurrected, he sprouted to new life. The seed died and it sprouted. And now, because Jesus died and resurrected, what is he going to bear? He is going to bear many children. The seed's seed, if you please. That's why in Galatians chapter 3, it says that Jesus is the seed of Abraham. He's the only seed. The promise was not made to seeds, but to the seed who is Christ. But then later on in the chapter it says, if you are Christ's, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Because when we join Jesus, we are the seed's seed. And the devil hates us as much as he hated Jesus. And so this verse is speaking about the final persecution against the church at the very end of time. And we will study more about this as we move along in this seminar.